Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the York Festival of Ideas. I'm uh, John Bowen from the University of York, from the English Department. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our, our speaker for tonight. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Christine Skelton, uh, uh, who's the Emeritus Professor of Gender Education in the School of Education at the University of Birmingham. Uh, since her retirement, she's taken her research specialism, which is in gender and masculinity, uh, into a new direction, focusing on the historical constructions uh, of those for the lives of Victorian women. Um, particularly so in her recently uh, published book, wonderful book, can I wave it now? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wonderful book, uh, Dickin Charles Dickens and Georgina Hogarth. And today um, we'll be discussing that, that extraordinary and vital relationship that Dickens and Georgina Hogarth have. Uh, so please welcome Christine Skelton. Thank you. Thank you. I want to start by saying something about how Georgina came into Dickens's life. Dickens was 22 years old and in 1834 he started as parliamentary reporter on the Morning Chronicle. George Hogarth was his superior and George took a liking to the young man and invited him home to meet his family. George and his wife had ten children, five boys and five girls. One of the girls had already died by the as a baby at the time that, uh, that Dickens was invited back to his house. But three of George's daughters were to become very important in Dickens' life. The eldest, Catherine, of course, became his wife. They were engaged within six months of meeting each other and they married the following year. Next in line was Mary Hogarth. She was four years younger than Catherine and the two were great, sister, great friends as well as sisters. And down the other end of the age spectrum was Georgina. She was the, the Hogarth's eighth child and she was about seven when Dickens first met her. Dickens was absolutely devoted to Mary Hogarth. He adored her. And when she died very suddenly in her bedroom at Dowerty Street, I should add, she didn't live there, but she did have her own bedroom because she stayed over quite often. Dickens was distraught. He kept all her dresses in the wardrobe. He took a ring off her finger and wore it on his own for the rest of his life. He purchased a double burial plot so that when his time came, he could be laid to rest alongside her. Don't know what Catherine thought about that. And for the first and only time in his life, he missed a publication deadline. He was um, writing Pickwick Papers and Oliver Twist at the time, and he missed the deadlines for both. The one thing that Mary's death did do was to leave a gap, which was later to be filled by Georgina. Now, we know Georgina was one of the most important women in his life, despite the fact she gets little, uh, little very rarely discussed in his biographies, because Dickens told us that she was. In his will, he made her guardian of his youngest children, who had not yet reached their majority, despite the fact that Catherine was still alive. He left her all his private papers, and he was obviously a very quite a secretive person, so to do that was shows his trust in her. And he left her all the personal objects that he treasured. He also left her the equivalent of, in today's money, just over a million pounds. During his lifetime, he made several comments about her which showed how much he admired her. Why I use the subtitle, A Curious and Enduring Relationship, is because of the 28 years that they, and I sometimes say lived together, but that gives the wrong impression, lived alongside each other, they played different roles in each other's life at different times. And there were five different phases, and the end of each phase was triggered by a different event. The first stage was when Dickens and Catherine were in loco parentis. Jo Catherine, sorry, Georgina was just 15 years old when she moved in with the Dickenses. Catherine was 27 and Dickens was 30. There was a 12-year age gap between Catherine and Georgina. In fact, Georgina was closer in age to the Dickenses' eldest daughter, Mamie, than she was to Catherine. And at the point that she moved in, the Dickenses had four children of their own, but they were all under six. The second stage came simply because Georgina grew up and a genuine friendship developed between Georgina and Dickens. They shared a similar sense of humour. 
Georgina was an avid newspaper reader and she was able to talk about the latest social and political developments with Dickens. And for all her life, she relished long, fast-paced walks. So she was one of the few people who could match Dickens's 7 to 12 miles per day at the rate of 4 miles per hour. And Georgina always talked about these as the happiest days of her life. She was a tremendous asset to the Dickens family at this point. In the morning, she would go up to the nursery and help the governess teach the younger children their letters. In the evenings, she could entertain the Dickens' guests. She'd inherited some of her father's musical sp skills and was very an adept piano player. And she, had, she was a great mimic, mimic had a great sense of humour with, her, with them. Um, visitors to the house talked about her being witty, intelligent and attractive. Now, I want to focus on the next stages of their relationship because this is when Georgina's reputation, her health and her status changed and not for the better. I also want to stress the significance of Catherine to Georgina and Dickens's relationship because they were a unit. There was three of them and uh, relations between any two at any one point impacted on the third person in that group. In 1850, Georgina was 23 years old. She'd lived with the Dickenses now for eight years. Right, eight years. Baby Dora died in 1850, and this was at the same time as Dickens discovered the lease on Devonshire Terrace was due to come up. He hadn't realised it was due to end. They'd lived there for 12 years, most happily, so they had to start looking for somewhere else. And it was all change around about this point. They moved to Tavistock House and Dickens was showing signs of a midlife crisis. Now you could say, how do we know Dickens was having a midlife crisis? Because he could do in 24 hours what would take most people a month to do. Well, he'd gone into overdrive. Alongside his usual writing schedule and his work at Urania Cottage with Angela Burdett Coots for the Home for Homeless Women, he was touring his amateur theatrical group more regularly than normal. He started the weekly household journal, Household Words, which gave him a reason to rent offices in Wellington Street, and he had the rooms above made into accommodation so he could entertain his male friends there or even stay over if he couldn't manage the few streets back to Tavistock House. He made a new friend in Wilkie Collins, the author, who was 12 years his junior, frequent lord and amuser, he lived with his housekeeper and her daughter. And the two men used to go on jaunts around Britain and Europe, getting up to whatever they got up to. At this time, he regrew his moustache. He was drinking more than was usual for Dickens, who was normally quite abstemious. And he was flirting with one of the wives of the, one of the writers on Household Words. And he was criticising Catherine. He complained she'd had too many children. Nothing to do with him, of course. He started making pointed and public comments about her weight. And he complained that her parents abused his hospitality. He had a point there. And at the same time as disparaging Catherine, he started showing he preferred Georgina's company and domestic skills. He was flattering her a lot. When he was on holiday with Wilkie and Augustus Egg, he would write alternately to Georgina and to Catherine, but these letters were meant to be shared amongst each other. The letters to Georgina talked about how much he was missing her, but the letters to Catherine said nothing like that. Now, up until this point, Georgina had already had, two su had suitors and she'd had two proposals and she'd had a recent crush on Edward Bulwer-Lytton. But at this point, nobody was on her romantic horizons. And Dickens was not watching his behaviour. He was simply acting too intimately with her. For example, holiday homes. Their holiday homes always involved some degree of rejigging of the rooms to accommodate guests. And Georgina often found that she was having to share her room with a female visitor. What she was probably less prepared to find is that Dickens had moved in as well. So on some occasions, he had his washing facilities moved in so he could use it as a dressing room. On another occasion, he had his writing materials moved in and used it on a, as a study. He thought nothing about waking her up in the middle of the night because he wanted somebody to talk to or he wanted her to go for a walk with him. 
And it's perhaps not surprising then that it was around this time that Katie Dickens, his daughter, who was a teenager herself at this point, and her friend Annie Thackeray both noticed that Auntie Georgie appears to have fallen in love with Dickens. Now, one of Georgina's characteristics is that she was sensible. And whatever her emotions were doing, she knew nothing was going to come of this. And most importantly, she did not want Dickens and Catherine to, se to se separate. Tensions in the house continued for the next four years, which at least gave Georgina enough time to get a grip of her emotions. But Catherine and Dickens were not getting on, and the inevitable happened. He fell in love with the 18-year-old actress, Nellie Turner. Now, what happened then drove a wedge between Georgina and Catherine because they had completely different views on what Dickens was up to. Both of them had seen Dickens have these... He used to get these little infatuations. He'd had an infatuation with Christiana Weller. He'd had an infatuation with Emma Pickin. But these flared up and they disappeared when Dickens got bored, which was usually within months, sometimes just weeks. Dickens was insisting he had no improper designs on Nellie. And Georgina knew that there was a huge age gap because Ellen was the same age as Katie. So she completely and utterly believed in what, George, what Dickens was saying. Catherine, on the other hand, didn't believe her. When Dickens tried to defend himself by making public statements implying Catherine wanted the separation, the newspapers started to ask questions. And when Dickens published a personal statement mentioning the involvement of innocent persons, the newspapers started to ask, well, who were these innocent people? And if he's claiming they're innocent, well, that's kind of encouraging the idea that something was going on somewhere. Georgina, in the meantime, because she was completely um, supportive of Dickens, became estranged from her family. They wanted her to leave when Catherine was being evicted, and she refused. And it was not long after that that Dickens heard from a Scottish journalist that a Scottish editor was about to publish a piece in the newspaper to say that he had had three children with Georgina. Dickens obviously wanted to quell this at all uh, straight away. Now, this was because it was particularly inflammatory, given that a relationship between a man and his sister-in-law was regarded as incest. Now, this is one particular rumour which has never gone away. Jumping forward a moment, the Guardian was just one of many newspapers which carried this article in 2009 that said there was evidence the family of one Hector Charles Bulwer Lytton Dickens were trying to sell a ring that had belonged to their father, well, great, great, great father, and because they believed they were related to the Dickens family. Hector had come forward in 1908 claiming he was the illegitimate son of Georgina and, and Dickens. And he had successfully convinced some people, as well as his own family, hence their, their, their claims. It was only in 2014 that Mark Dickens and his cousin, who were the current heads of the Dickens family, had a DNA test to disprove this. But Hector was in the future. Go back to 1858. Dickens was terrified that he was about to lose his popularity, he was about to go on his first paid reading tour and he was concerned that the managers of the venues he was booked into wouldn't, uh, would cancel their bookings or that his beloved readers might not buy tickets. And we know that Georgina had, was examined by a doctor and had a certificate of virginity issued. And nobody's seen it. We don't know when it was dated, but we know it exists. If Dickens was going to ask Georgina to do this, it was going to be about now, because he was concerned that the Hogarth just might encourage Catherine to apply for a divorce using the new divorce laws, which meant she could divorce him on the grounds of adultery plus incest. Wives could divorce husbands, but not just on the grounds of adultery. How he decided to protect his reputation, and to an extent Georgina's, we saw in the 1861 census. Now, in the column headed relation to head of family, Dickens entered wife's sister, as he always had done. The next column asked for rank, profession and occupation. Now, it was usual for the ladies of the house to have this column left blank. 
as Dickens did for his daughter, Mamie. But next to Georgina's name, he put servant housekeeper. So Georgina's status was reduced from upstairs to downstairs. They were now effectively employer and employee. Georgina was the housekeeper, Mamie was the hostess. So their once equitable friendship was now completely unbalanced. And indeed, he did treat her as a housekeeper. He took her very much for granted. Not long after the separation, they made Gads Hill in Kent their full-time home. And Georgina was often alone there. Katie was married. Mamie was supposed to be there, but she was more often than not away with friends. The boys were working or at school, and Dickens himself was splitting his time between the office, reading tours, Nelly, and occasionally Gads Hill. Now, this situation could have continued had it not been for the events of 1862. Anyone who's read Robert Garnett's analysis of Dickens's letters from this period know that Nelly, probably, possibly, circumstantial evidence permitting, became pregnant in the spring of 1862. And we know that Dickens moved Nellie and Mrs. Turner to France in the early summer. What Robert Garnett omitted to pick up was Georgina's involvement in helping him. The stress, or I should say perhaps the shock, gave her a physical and mental breakdown. At the time, she was diagnosed as having a heart condition, but in the book, I go on to give reasons as to why the symptoms and outcomes were more likely to have been caused by a breakdown. She was only 35 at the time when she was supposedly having this aneurysm of the aorta. The physical toll can be seen in these photographs. The photographs were taken in the early 1860s, the other person's Mamie. Uh, they're in full mourning, um, probably from looking at who died at that point. Georgina's mother died in 1863. They were still estranged at this point. So she was 36. The, the photograph on the right has often been misstated as being of Georgina in her 20s because she looks younger in the photograph on the right than on the left. She is, in fact, 39 here. Yeah, she's 39 here. It's taken in 1866. So we can see that she recovered Physically, but emotionally, she didn't. It took her about 10 years after Dickens's death to recover emotionally. She became needy and dependent on Dickens. When she knew he was going on a reading tour, she was past herself with anxiety. And she was writing these letters that were mourning his absence even before he'd gone. She was saying, well, I wish the time would hurry up and come so that he could go and then so he could be back again. She developed this very strange habit of repeating his opinions as if they were her own. So he wrote a piece to her at one point when he was in America about Longfellow and his, do and his daughter, saying she looked a bit strange, this daughter, and Longfellow was very boring. And six months later, Georgina's writing a letter, having met Longfellow, but she repeats Dickens' opinions word for word as if they're her opinions. And she starts to talk about, we think this, and our, and she, it's almost as if she's morphed into Dickens at that point. Also, in 1946, leaping on, Dickens's grandson made a very strange comment. He said that the, it was a myth that Georgina was a perfect housekeeper. In fact, she was nothing of the kind. She was helpless and inefficient. Well, he knew her, obviously, in the years after Dickens died as helpless and inefficient. But you have to ask what happened. Dickens was so fastidious about his environment, there's no way that he would have praised Georgina's housekeeping skills if they hadn't been actually really spot on. So it's evidence to sort of suggest that she lost those skills, she lost confidence. Certainly at this point, she started to have a lot more problems with the servants, and Dickens was keeping the account books, household account books, which you wouldn't expect him to, to be doing because that's the housekeeper's job. What the illness did do was bring about a return to a more equal relationship. Dickens was much more solicitous towards her. He started to take her away. He hadn't taken her away for years, but he gave her little weekend treats. He worried about her all the time and he even flirted a little bit with her. Georgina was devastated by his death. She was the unofficial widow. She was the one who had to sort through the clothes. She was the one who had to make an itinerary 
of all the contents of Gadsill. Bearing in mind, she didn't just lose Dickens, she lost her home because Gadsill was part of the estate. And she wrote to one person saying, I'm having to buy back the plates and the seats that we were sitting on. So the devastation was made worse by the loss of her home. She was in deep mourning for 10 years. She was very much like Queen Victoria. She suffered from complicated grief. And so she was, she, she, it, it took a toll. She was executor of the will, but it was, as I said, in, she was in her 50s by the time she got her act together. She outlived Dickens by 47 years, living to the age of 90, and she devoted her life to protecting Dickens' legacy. I've done it in the 20 minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Pretty fast paced, but I think you've got the gist. Thank you very much, Catherine. That, that was fascinating. Um, I've got so many things I want to ask you about. So perhaps we might have a short discussion yeah. and then we'll open it and there'll be time for questions from everybody else. One thing, um, there's a way in which Dickens can push himself centre stage in any relationship. So I just wonder about his, her relation, Georgina's relationship with Catherine, her older sister. Um, and the family. Could you just tell us a bit more about them? I mean, sometimes it's been presented rather simply as a rivalry or yeah. An yeah. envy, but my sense from reading your book was just how complicated and mm. changing mm. it was. Mm. Is that right? Yeah. They had, they were, had a really good sisterly bond, uh, which is strange given the, the age gap. Um, but you could see that I think Catherine was probably more friendly towards Georgina than Georgina was to Catherine, simply because Catherine had a really unenviable position. When Georgina came, moved in, she was a teenager. 15-year-old Victorian girls were no less of trouble than 15-year-old girls in the, 18, in the 1950s or 2000s or whatever. And the, it was almost as if Victorian etiquette was set up to generate teenage resentment. So teenage girls were told that they had to dress differently to older married women. They had to dress less elaborately. Um, so she couldn't wear the same kinds of clothes that Catherine was wearing. She couldn't um, initiate conversation. She had to wait for Catherine to initiate it because she was the married woman when they were in company. So she, she had to go around very much in Catherine's wake. And Catherine made one really fatal mistake. When she went visiting, which Georgina always did, went with her, she would present her card at the door. And in the, when a young woman first went into society, they would, turn, they would have the corner of the visiting card turned down so that the host would know that the person who was coming was accompanied by a young lady. When they'd been in society for a couple of years, then they should have had their own visiting card. For whatever reasons, I mean, Catherine did have a lot on the plate. She never got Georgina a, a visiting card, which caused problems later on. But it would be the equivalent of saying to a teenager today, no, you can't have a smartphone. So you can, you can imagine this teenager growing up with this old sister who was also trying to act as her mother because Mrs Hogarth was in no state herself at that point. She was mourning Mary's loss and then her mother died <coughs> suddenly and her son died two weeks later. So she was obviously quite distressed. So Catherine more or less had to be mother and older sister. So you could see cracks starting then. But they only really started to show as Georgina reached adulthood. And there were two women in the house. It's that idea of two women in the kitchen. And they think they managed quite well about having their own roles. But you, Georgina wanted her own dependence. So she was developing her own set of friends to Catherine's. And they were very different women. So I think they were quite tight until just Georgina grew up and she had a few resentments towards her. Does that sort of...? Yes, I mean, it's such an interesting dynamic. I mean, the two dead siblings, I think, is mm. really interesting. Mm. Mm. Like, Lily Nader, there was a quote in your book, says that Georgina presents herself as a woman who knows her place. Mm. Is, is that fair, do you think? Yes, I, I think... She had a thing about men of genius. Now, th this was a, a, a Victorian phrase that was applied to men who were at their... who were the prime people in their field. They'd reached their peak. Dickens was a man of genius. William McCready in the theatre was a man of genius. And, of course, they were great friends. Thomas Carlyle, the historian, was a man... And they were the ones that were, they were mixing with. And Georgina, she always was in awe of these men. And 
so she 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 kind of always cowed out to them. She was a she she liked to she liked to she was always flattered if they paid her attention. So I think knowing her place when it came to men. I'm not just so sure with women. I think she did. I think she was like most people. She was a, a, a mixture of people. She, the confidence that we associate with Georgina tends to come. She was, it was there when she was a young woman in her twenties, and then it came to the fore when she wasn't worrying anymore about whether she, Dick, she was going to get Dickens' approval or not. She was executor of his estate. So I think she did know her place amongst certain people. But there is that long. There's forty years, isn't there, that she lives years. after his death, where she has immense power over the whole shaping of his career and legacy and she edits the letters and owns the copyright and lots of the objects so it, she's yeah. she she the power relations there are very it took it took her a time to get into that that for those first 10 years when she was in such deep mourning which also i mean this is an aside given that he left her over a million pounds and she was she knew she could live on 400 pounds a year which would have been the interest on the money that she was left she was burning through it and that was because she was so distraught and she kept saying, I don't, I don't care about the house, I don't care about the furniture, maybe once this I'm just letting her have it. So she was getting through a lot of money, which is one reason I think she started to do the letter. She wasn't really bothered for those ten years. She left everything to Frederick Ouvry, his solicitor, and to John Forster. So she was very much in the background. If she saw something she didn't like, she'd alert them to it, but they were the ones who were doing the main bit of work. It was when Ouvry died, well, Forster died first and then Ouvry died, and there was nobody else. She was the only executive that was left, and she was, she'd made other friends at that time, Janie and Horace Pym, who were, who, who'd known of Dickens, but they were other people she was getting support from. So I think she started to get more confident at, at that point and then started. And also she, she developed this almost quasi-religious attitude towards him at that point. Um, everything was reverent. You had to think of his name with reverence and everything he owned had to be treated with veneration. But I think that's part of this complicated grief that she had, which was the same illness that, that um, Queen Victoria had, which, is, which was triggered by a series of things. One, family history, which her mother showed. Um, another was the fact, dependency on the person that had died, which clearly she was, and she hadn't recovered from the, the physical and emotional breakdown that she'd had. Um, another was a series of losses. Now, in the February, her father had died suddenly, and then MacLeese died, and then Lemon died, and then June Dickens died. So she just lost, you know, huge swathes of contact points within a, a short space of time. So I think that pushed her into this complicated grief. She's still using thick bordered mourning paper for a long time after the, she should have been. So, yeah, it, she kind of got to that stage later. That's really interesting. And I mean, one thing that she does, of course, is censor a lot. Mm. So she censors the letters oh, and cuts bit out. And, um, you know, there's a whole attempt to just bury the whole. Ellen's story. I mean, so if you could maybe wave your magic biographical wand and find some thing or some lost document or some bit of her life, is there something in particular that when you were writing it you thought, you know, if only I knew this or... It's only that I wish she hadn't been so coy about everything. She wouldn't tell anybody <laughs> anything. <laughs> Annie Field, who was Dickens's um, dearest woman, it, she was the wife of his American publisher. And she and Annie got on really well. I think partly because Annie lived in Boston. So it was almost like when, when Georgina was writing to her, she was using it a bit like a diary. But she was still very cautious in, in what she said. Mm. She, she, wouldn't, she wouldn't share anything. So Ellen, um, Annie knew about Ellen, Nellie. And she, you can see from some of Annie's letters, she's trying to push Georgina to say something. But she won't say anything. I mean, you can, Mamie, the, her niece, died of alcoholism. She wouldn't even tell her brothers in Australia that she died of alcoholism. She, they were saying, oh, she, she, she just disappeared, she just weakened. No, she was a lush. She, she got cirrhosis of the liver. But she wouldn't, she wouldn't admit to anything. She was so protective. So it's that. I, just, I wish she'd left something that said what she really thought and what she really felt instead of just trying to... He's so protective. And that would be true, presumably, of Alan Turner as well, so that she, like, in, in your account, she's in love with Dickens, at least, 
she then goes into a kind of breakdown during the, when she discovers the sexual truth of that relationship. Um, but then she stays friends with Alan until their, till, till their death. Yeah. Is that right? Um, so, so presumably there, there's a whole unspoken secret. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, emotional life. Yeah, the book it? you referred to, the Catherine Longley book in A Partner's Tale, um, it's, it's in it she quotes, Catherine, Kathleen co quotes, the friend of Nellie's daughter. And this friend is saying they knew that sometimes that Nellie went away to stay with Georgina and obviously things hadn't gone well because she came back and she wasn't mentioning it and she was warned, don't mention Georgina, don't mention Miss Hogarth. So they obviously had some tense times as well, but they were really, they had to stick together because, because she knew her secret. And, that, and I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm intrigued about this business of, they, were, they all ended up poor, Nellie and Georgina and even though they had so much, um, they'd had so much left them. And there is this the discovery at the Dickens Museum that some of the items there are supposedly from 1840s or 1850s, and they've got hallmarks of 1890s. <laughs> and they're carrying an authentication card from Georgina. And it's, why would she do that? Because she was so careful about protecting Dickens's legacy. You can't see her writing an authentication card for something that she thought was a copy. But I was wondering what Nellie, because Nellie would have had a lot of stuff as well. She couldn't go to a shop and say, oh, this belonged to Charles Dickens, because her husband didn't know that she'd been, that she didn't know how old Nellie was, never mind anything else. She couldn't make that connection. Oh. But I am sure that Georgina would be writing authentication cards for Nelly, and who knows, Nelly might have had copies made of stuff so she could sell stuff two or three times, who knows. So it's all, mm, there's still a lot to find out yet. Yes, the whole story of Dickens' later years has just been tiny fragments and hints put together from, uh, you know, and you're so scrupulous in the book about, about it's, it, it's not, not even a jigsaw puzzle, I mean, it's a jigsaw puzzle with lots of pieces missing. Yes. Um, no, that's terrific, thank you. Perhaps we yeah. open up the conversation. Yeah. Are there other questions that people want to ask? Thank you. Hi. Sorry, yeah. go on. Was there any sign of reconciliation between... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I Good meant to say grief. you're not allowed to speak unless you have a mic. We're all high-tech. <laughs> uh, was there any sign of reconciliation between Catherine and Georgina in their later years, or were they completely estranged? Depends who you're listening to. I'm listening to you. Yeah. <laughs> Kath, Katie, Katie said that she affected a reconciliation in 1875. Well, I don't think Georgina knew about that because there is at one point that Annie Fields asks Georgina about Catherine and Georgina says, I don't want to say too much about my sister. Um, all I can say is that we've, right from the beginning, i.e. after Dickens's death, we have been going to see her regularly. Not that it gives any of us any pleasure. So she, and to be fair to Georgina, she did nurse Catherine when Catherine had cervical cancer. And she was also nursing her younger brother and his wife at the same time, so she was dashing around looking after them. And her letters then are saying, oh, my poor sister, you know, she suffers greatly, but, you know, she's doing her best. And then, after Catherine died, she reverted to type and started saying things about Catherine. Um, and she did try and rewrite Catherine's legacy in many ways. She, she said the reason she was writing, doing the edited collection of letters, was she said, because if people knew the truth about my sister, then, um, then perhaps they would have treated Dickens more kindly at the time. If they'd have known his side of the story, well, which is a bit of a joke, really, because the only side of the story anybody heard was Dickens. Never <laughs> nobody had heard Catherine's side of the story at all. Um, actually, just if I could just... I mean, I think Catherine dies the very week that the two the volumes of Letters are yeah, published. Yeah, yeah. And they almost completely cut her out of the story. Mm, mm. Um, and I don't know if she, if she saw them or or not, but it would have been an awful way to go, I think. And that one reason that she did give her own letters to her daughter, Katie, and said, 
give them to the British Museum so that they will know that he once loved me. Mm. So mm. I think Georgina was very... Mm. Um, and that one did, did really try to cut her out of the story. And the only reason I can put down to, to why she did that, because I understand the teenage resentment thing, I understand that. You're growing up, your older sister, and they're getting on your nerves. And blah, blah, blah. So all of that stuff. But then when she got so nasty about her later on, I think it's because she had in her mind that if only Catherine <clears throat> could have been the sort of wife that Dickens deserved, then all of the shenanigans <laughs> that they'd had later wouldn't have happened. Now, I th I, sure. We can always debate this to whether Catherine was depressed or not. Um, she was showing signs of depression, clearly, and she had a lot to be depressed about. Um, and I think Georgina was never tolerant of that. Um, so I think that it, it's, it's, it, it is a shame that she, she, she felt she had to do that. I don't really understand why she had to get so nasty, other than, well, she wasn't good enough for him. I've seen a few hands go up. So one there, I think, at the back, and then there, and then here. So this one, if you just wait for the mic, then they'll come. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. It's kind of been argued that Dickens writes a lot about his own life in his stories. Were there any characters that you would say were inspired by Georgina? Oh, yes. Well, he said, and so did she, Esther Summershun in Bleak House. So she, somebody asked her um, from the Dickens Fellowship in about just before she died, it was about 1930, 1914. And she said yes. It was, just that it was, and some people said Agnes Whitfield, but she said, no, 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 I wasn't Agnes Whitfield. That was, that was Mary Hogarth. Um, but there are some things about Esther Summershun, which is, which is about me. And there's just one bit in Bleak House where you suddenly get Georgina's, because Esther is like, oh, sweeter than sweet. But there's one line when she's talking about the honours system, and you get that sharp Georgina's intellect coming through. It's about, that's the only one that we know of, that we know for sure. And that's also about a, a young woman living with an older man in whom she's got a quasi-familial yeah, relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? So yeah. there's a, that dynamic is... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think he was working... I think he suspected at one point that Georgina was in love with him. So if you look at that, Michael Slater brings it up in one of his books about this weird proposal of Mr Jarndyce to Esther. And he says, that seems a really weird thing. But, of course, the way in which Dickens was writing Bleak House, he was Esther and the narrator. And it was almost as if he was asking himself questions about, well, does she have more than sister-in-law feelings towards me? But, of course, the way, what he makes Esther say is that, oh, no, 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 she loves him and she can see that she has an allegiance to him, but it's, you know, basically it's not sexual, it's not emotional. Uh, well, it's not, it's not a sexual thing. So I think he, he thought that mm, perhaps um, she might have a thing for me, but he comforted himself that she probably didn't, which she did. I think just over here, so I, I saw a hand, <laughs> and then here. Uh, it's probably too silly a question. Oh. What did she spend all the money for? Um, <laughs> I've looked through 47 years of her bank accounts. And, <laughs> and it was a nightmare because I wanted because because she said she'd have this 400 pounds and then by the end of the first year she'd spent over a thousand so she was into the capital. I mean kind of understand that because she, one thing I don't know you know it's a bit like when the kids first leave home and you're still buying the same amount of food that you used to. So when Dickens died she started renting houses that were the same kinds of houses that Dickens would have rented. So they were too big, they were too expensive, she had too many servants. So you could understand that first year why she was spending too much. And then because she was in this deep depression, she was still buying bits and pieces of furniture and she loved Harvey Nicks and the Army and Navy stores. And apparently, um, Walter, what's his, Walter Spencer said she spent it on flowers, I can't see how she meant to spend that much on flowers. Um, so I think she was being quite frivolous with some of it, but also, and Dickens wouldn't have liked this, because he hated her younger sister, Helen Hogarth, and Helen's husband had died. And Catherine and Mr Hogarth had been giving Helen money. And then, of course, when they went, there was nobody. Georgina was supporting Helen and her niece, and she was also supporting her brother, William. So Dickens definitely wouldn't have liked to use it, but she was she she was supporting, she was giving money to them as well, and quite substantial sums. They were regular amounts of money. So a bit of frivolity and a bit of doing good, really. 
And here, um, I think the mics is coming. <laughs> Yeah, thanks very much. Very interesting. I, I've got a lot of Dickens books. I thought he was a, sort of quite a perfect person, actually. <laughs> Just an author, you know. Yeah, yeah. He went all around, uh, he um, emphasised the poor, you know, because his books a lot of meaning to it, you know, like the yeah. London and uh, London and Paris. But um, the question is, what did he die of? He had a stroke. Oh, he had a stroke, didn't he? Yes, he had oh. a stroke. Oh, he, right. he died at Gads Hill. Although there's that rumour that he died at Nelly's house having intercourse, and they put him on the back of a cart and moved him <laughs> all the way to Gads... Well, which is... He'd had some little strokes before, hadn't yeah. he? So there's one bit where he, he can't see out of one eye and um, the shop fronts look slightly strange to him. So I think he's had a couple of mini-strokes. Um, he knows his health's not good because he, he puts in the contract for Edwin Drew what, the, what would happen if he died. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he, he, di yeah, he dies at 58 of a stroke. Yeah. He looked a lot older. I mean, he really did work himself into the ground. There's a wonderful bit in the book where you quote the diet that he was put on for oh, yeah. a stroke, oh, which yeah. involved... Was it... I oh, mean, it was sherry... Champagne, sherry, egg, yeah. beer and wine. Yeah. I mean, it was mainly alcohol. It was alcohol, yeah. <laughs> With an egg, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, it is, you know, uh, so... Uh, and he had a doctor waiting in the wings, didn't he, yeah. when he was doing his final performances, yeah. Yeah. to then take his pulse to see how he yeah. was. Other question? Hi. The mic is coming. So an actor as well, was it? Mm. Oh, yeah. Very good. He, he could never decide whether he wanted to go into acting or writing, and it was only because the day he had a, an interview at, uh, was it somewhere in Drury Lane? Covent Garden, Covent Garden, 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 Garden And he had bad cold and couldn't go. And he, he got an article accepted, didn't he? So that was, that was it. He was going to go down the, the, the author route. The author was possible. He was Boz. He was Boz, and, and then his artist fizz. was Fizz. Fizz? His illustrator was Fizz? Yeah, that's right. Hi, uh, thank you. You mentioned that um, her grief was similar to Queen Victoria. Uh, do you feel that she actually came through her grief in the end, or did yes. she still die grieving? No, no, no. Well, she was still um, devoted. I mean, she, I can't remember who gave her the, the name Guardian of the Beloved Memory, whether that was one of the whether that was just Arthur Adrian, who was one of her earlier biographies, or that was somebody through whether the Boz Club or the Dickens Fellowship or whatever. But, yes, she did... She, I mean, she had... She was very close to Henry, the young, one of the younger uh, Dickens boys and his family. And um, Marie was very good. His wife was very good to her. And, yeah, I mean, she, she, she was kind of... Not revered, but she, she had an important part in his, his, his legacy... And so she, yeah, she, she, she was always going to miss him, but she, it wasn't that deep, awful grief that she was in when she, she, she used to, life isn't worth living, and the reason for being alive is just gone, and it was just the shock, I think, and everything. So ten years it took her to get mm. through that. So was it the financial situation that drove her out of her grief? Do you think, or was it just simply time? No, I mean she never got out of the financial problems. I think it was just time. I think it was the, over those ten years and she had so many problems with Mamie because they'd been really close and they were sharing a house and then that didn't work out and Mamie went off with somebody. So I think life so, sort of caught, caught up with her. And she, it's just time. It was just time that she needed. But as I said, it was a lot longer than you would think a normal period of grief because at five years, Mamie was moving on. Um, all the children, Ellen had married by that point, they were all moving on, but she was still stuck in this real sort of grief stage. Um, but as I said, I think that was all tied in with that physical and emotional breakdown, and she just needed time to recuperate. And how did Catherine grieve? Did she grieve when he died? Yeah, she, apparently she... Didn't she find out that he died because it was announced on a billboard or something? You know, one of those sheets that they have advertising the newspapers outside news agents, and that's apparently how she found out that Dickens had died because they hadn't got quick... To her quickly enough, Katie went up to tell her. Yes, she grieved, but I think with Catherine, she'd already been ousted from her home. So she'd got her own home at that point, and she'd got her... Seven, whereas I think with Georgina and Mamie, they, they lost Dickens, they lost their house, they lost furniture, they lost their income, they lost their lifestyle, they lost everything at, at, at that point, and they had to start again. Catherine had already been pushed into that position, so, yes, she, she, she grieved him, 
but um, I think it was just a different situation for them both. So did Catherine actually have finance to survive afterwards? Yes, he left her money. He, I mean, he was paying for her anyway, he was giving her allowance. It was cut, but she had money in a trust fund, which I think Henry, and I presume Ouvry, um, monitored for her. So she was used to be getting £600 a year, and that was reduced to 400 but she could still manage, which is why Georgina thought she could manage on the 400 having her money invested. And it was getting that amount but she just wasn't managing it um, managing it as well um, yes I mean Catherine said that she she was she was distraught to start with but she also benefited a little bit because she was the official widow as I said Georgina was the unofficial one who was sorting out his personal belongings but she Catherine was the one who got the card from Queen Victoria Catherine was the one who the first Dickens biographer went to to ask for her views and her experiences of Dickens' life. So she kind of regained some kind of position of her of being Dickens' wife at that point. I mean, Catherine's moment comes, I think, when about a year or so, when she knows she has cancer, knows she's dying. That's the moment when I think everything, all her grief and resentment and anger at Dickens comes out, I think. Is that both, when the letter was written? Because well, it's it was... both when she tells the neighbours to the, the, those are some letters I found in a, a few years ago where she told the next door neighbour and he wrote to a friend the, the stuff about Dickens trying to put her in a madhouse. Uh, but also I think Katie says it in, the, there's a book called uh, Dickens and Daughter by Gladys Story which was, had a lot of input by, by his daughter Katie and she said that's when her mother's grief all poured out. So Catherine held it all in till the very end. I think probably with Georgina that she had a very anxious time immediately after the death. But after a while, she had status. The Dickens Fellowship was set up. The big secrets hadn't come out. You know, she um, and that I and all that the grief became idealisation. I think, and so Dickens was this wholly idealised kind of figure, and that was very continued in the biographies, yeah, yeah. didn't it? Until yeah. you know, until well into the twentieth century. So there. Grief journeys are kind of interesting, I think, mm. and different. Mm. You can read his life in a lot of his books. I don't care a lot about it, because I think yeah. he had a very safe life, actually. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> no, he hasn't amazed. And so does, I mean, so does, so does uh, Georgina, in a way. Like, her father, is, I didn't know this, their father goes bankrupt yeah. and goes to jail. Twice. Two, twice. Two siblings die young. You know, the, it's, a, it's a very precarious life mm. <laughs> that they both have. Mm. More questions? Hi. There's a mic. Yeah. I'm sorry. A really simple question. So, was it how usual, how normal was it for two families to be so entwined? If you imagine it today, you wouldn't believe it. No, it was quite, it was quite common for a younger sibling to go and live in the home of an older married sibling, mm. um, either because of familial illness or because of debt. And I think it was to do with debt that Georgina moved in. It was to ease Mr Hogarth's <laughs> financial problems because he'd been imprisoned up till then. Um, some of the boys were about to go away. If, if Georgina, who was 15, and obviously she was going to have to start looking for a husband at some point, moved in the Dickens circle, she could live there and Mr Hogarth could go and get cheaper accommodation and they could manage with a maid of all work then. So it wasn't unusual, that was quite, quite common. Um, what was less usual was that the fact Georgina moved in and stayed. <laughs> they kind of expected her to get married and, and move out. But she did, she did get proposals, but um, she didn't choose not to. I always said this in the book. You keep hearing Georgina chose to devote herself to the, to the Dickens children and to Dickens and and she'd made a decision not to get married. Well, I can't see that for one minute. One, she couldn't rely on Dickens supporting her. I mean, he didn't have to. And I think the reason that she, she, she refused the second proposal because she was having a, she was in her 20s, she was having a great time. Dickens was giving her touring parts in his amateur theatrical groups. She was invited to all the best drawing rooms in London. She was, having a whale of a time when she got the second proposal 
why would she want to go and marry a minor artist and go and live in house, his household when she could carry on doing what she could do and just hold out for something better to come up? So I think that's what she was doing. I think at that point she thought, well, if Catherine can get somebody like Dickens, I can probably get somebody like that because she stood in for Catherine when Catherine was pregnant or confined. She'd do the duties then. She didn't take over, but she stood in. And I think she just thought, well, I'll wait to see if something better comes along. So it wasn't grueling, but it was almost grueling. Well, I had this problem with the American publishers of the book. It wasn't grueling. I, I don't think it was grooming at all. It was her thinking, I will just wait for a better offer to come around. I don't think he did anything to make her stay. I think he just made that business of preferring Georgina's company to, to Catherine's was just because that's Dickens. Dickens did whatever Dickens wanted to do. And if Catherine was getting on his nerves and then Georgina could go for walks with him and she could play the piano and she could, I'll just ask her instead. I don't think he was thinking, oh, you know, I've got designs on her because he didn't. He only liked girls on the cusp of young womanhood, not necessarily to do anything with, just to talk about their ethereal spirits and... Just, to, 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 can I... Yeah. Just, well, I think one thing that Dickens... I, I wouldn't say it was grooming, but I do think he's very interested in groups that little... What Michael said called little nests of sisters. Mm. And that uh, Ellen Turner later is one of three sisters. And he's absolutely fascinated by that household where, where the father's dead and there's a mother and, and then three daughters. Um, Like young I think, um, I don't know, perhaps you've got views on this. I, I think it may be something to, several things, I think. It may be something about his own sisters. He has two sisters himself. It may be that this is, the social relationships are like this. There's no welfare state. There's lots of w women forced into economic dependency, and so that's more common, and families are larger. Um, it may be that there's something he finds particularly interesting or intriguing about the kinds of relationships that sisters have, mm. I think. Um, that it's a way of being, of forms of, um, which he might think of as, as it were, non-sexual friendship, for example, uh, or non-sexual intimacy, familial intimacy, um, uh, and idealization, I think, of, of, of young women, I think. Those might be part of it, but it does seem to be, I, I, I don't have a simple explanation for it, but it does seem to be a recurrent pattern in the Hogarth family, and later when he he goes headlong into in love with the Turnans. Does that? Mm, yeah, yeah. I don't know what. I know he was. He had two sisters, Letitia and and Fanny, and I know he was very fond of Fanny, no, less so of Letitia. But I don't know what their the, the sisters' relationship was like as well. So that would have been quite interesting to to see what they. But, he had more brothers and sisters, so that might have been yeah. part of his attraction, just seeing how, the, how that sister relationship worked. Hiya. Oh, something, oh, something else that's interesting, um, I think Charles Dickens worked as a railway clerk for a bit in York in the old West offices, uh, you know, it's the 19th century. I think he did. Or no, not. it was his brother. His brother. His yeah. brother. Oh, his, his brother. brother did, did yeah. he? Oh, that's interesting. He was an engineer, wasn't it, his brother? Yes, he was, that's right. Yeah. Oh, he worked in York, yeah. did he? Uh, what was his name, John? Alfred. Was it Alfred? I think it was, yes, it was Alfred. All, they were the same name. There names are a lot. Sort of yeah, Alfred yeah, did. I think yeah. it's Alfred. Um, and he's the one that worked in York. Yeah. Just, uh, we've only got a couple of minutes, so are there any Sorry. final, final questions? Hiya. Yeah. <laughs> I wondered, um, I've read a, a few of the letters, and I, I, it always strikes me how Catherine, especially initially, was just so invested in being Scottish and, you know, needing the pan that was from Edinburgh, and you could Dickens was complaining you could get them in London, but that wasn't good enough. And um, did Georgina have anything like that? Was she interested in her Scottishness, or because she was younger when they moved, maybe not? She was younger, so she didn't grow up the strong Scottish accent uh, because uh, she'd been born in Edinburgh, but she was about two when they moved away, and uh, which obviously played to her strengths when he went. But he hated everything Scots, and he hated the Scots t the Scotch tongue, as he put it. Um, and there is one letter when somebody had gone to Scotland and they were going to send her some shortbread down. I think it was George Dolby was going to send her some, um, some shortbread. So she kind of liked a few things, but I don't think she made a particularly big thing about it because, of course, he turned against his Scottish in-laws and she wasn't going to rattle that cage. Uh, I'm afraid we're, we're, 
we've come to the end of our time. I'm really sorry about that because I felt no, we could have um, gone on much longer. So I have to say one thing before we go, and that is that Christine will be downstairs uh, signing Oops, copies of her books, right which are available from uh, Fox Lane Books. Mm -hmm. um, so so uh, I, I, I read it twice and oh. <laughs> loved it both times. It's Thank absolutely you. terrific book, I think. So uh, I hope you'll join me in thanking Christine for that really <laughs>